Hi everybody, welcome back to the lecture of computer animation. Today about rational curves and parametric surfaces. So far we had uniform non-rational B-splines. So well, um, if we have a uniform B-spline then we have nodes at regular intervals on the curve. Remember nodes were the connection point between neighboring curves. And um, the basis functions of the individual sections results from translation, which leads to easy calculations. But the disadvantages are that we have an unsatisfactory interpolation of control points. Remember, we just approximate the control points and um, not necessarily go near them. And we might have unsatisfactory interpolation of start and end points. You could also see that in our examples that actually the start and end points are quite far from the end of the curve. And also the insertion of additional control points is not easily possible in this way. So that leads us to non-uniform non-rational beast lines. So here we have the possibility of a repetition of control points and that gives us more weight to that control point. Right, so here my first example. So we had this example about B splines over two intervals here last time. But now instead of having an additional point, we just now let the last two points coincide. So basically I repeat this last point and then we can take a look at the difference and we should see that the curve is actually now much closer to P3 uh, than the single points. So let's try that. So first let me again do this example here. Copy. Open my terminal shell and let it run with Python 3. Okay, so here you can see it. We have a total of five control points, the red dots, and here we have two curve segments. So here you can see here in the middle would be the knot. Then we have the second curve here, the first curve. The first curve is only based on the first four control points. The second curve is based on the last four control points. And you can see here it's actually quite distant to the last, to the end control points. So now let's take uh, this non-uniform example, copy, and let me open an editor to take a look at it. Gedit, and here you can see the content. So what's different here is that we basically repeat this last point. P4 now is equal to P3. That's the only difference here, right? So we just repeat this last point and now we can see what difference that makes. So Python 3, yeah, so now you can see it. So this last point from the previous example is now moved onto um, the previous point, so, um, now this last point is double and you can see the second curve now indeed goes much closer to this last point. Compare that with the first point here, there's quite some distance. And now this almost goes into this last point. So in this way we could give this last control point double the weight as the other ones. Okay, so indeed we see the curve is now much closer, coming much nearer to um, and this last point P3. Yeah, so here are some more examples for non-uniform, non-rational B splines. So now we have a non-uniform because we can repeat points, control points. And here you can see an example where the first control point, number zero, is repeated four times. So that basically means that the first interval, the first curve segment, is de uh, degenerating into one point. So the first segment is actually the first point or the first curve. So 
That's why the curve actually starts in this first point and then continues to go on because the next interval is based on 3 times 0 and then this 1, then the next interval is 2 times 0 and then 1, 2 and so on. And also here the last point is also repeated four times which means the curve ends in this exactly last control point. Here similar. So these curves start and end in their control points at the beginning and end. Same here. Yeah. And you can see the resulting blending function. So this is basically the resulting weighting function. So you can see because of the repetition, now we have a different function for the interpolation here. And we can see that um, it really has this factor one for the endpoints. And this is indeed used widely in practice. Yeah, so you can see some more examples. So here we have no multiple nodes or control points. Then here we have in B, we have a double node um, at number one. Here, this second control point number one, we have T4 equals T5. So this is doubling and so this, you can see those two points are now coincide. And um, this way we get a closer approximation of this point. You can actually see here there's so getting more steep through this um, tangent, the tangent here. Uh, but we also reduce the continuity. So um, we basically um, lose um, the G2 continuity um, at this point here. So here's an example for three times repetition. So here we have just C0 continuity, so the function itself. And when we have four times repetition here, you can see four times repetition, then we even lose the C0 continuity, which means we can create a gap here. So sometimes that's what we want, for instance, at the beginning or the end of an object. In other cases, we don't want it. You know, so here an example for a Bezier curve. So in Bezier curves, we can apply the same principle by repeating our control points. So here you can see it, that we have the first control point repeated four times, and also the last one. So that's why we get this curve here, which um, gives us this shape. Then B, um, we have this node vector, and here in C, we have this node vector again, repetition of four times. So we can influence the shape of the curve and the continuity by choosing the number of repetitions. Yeah, and here you can see how many control points influence a segment. So here you can see the curve segment and here are the control points. And um, you can see when we repeat points, um, then um, the curve segments um, depend on fewer neighboring curves, like illustrated here in, in gray. And we have basically those points identical. Yeah, so the advantage is that we have a better control of the curve shape, then we have a better control of continuity over multiple knots where those curves are connected. Then we have an interpolation of, of control start and end points, uh, which is possible, without the adjacent curve sections running um, um, straight through it. And we have a simple insertion of additional nodes or control points. Right, so we can define an end, uh, um, discrete end and start points. Yeah, and this leads us to rational curves. So with uh, repetition, we can give a control point the weight of one, two, three, four. Um, but sometimes we want to have a more fine control. And that's why um, rational curves are useful. So they give us an additional coordinate or weight, w of u, 
for more fine control of the weights of the control points. And this leads us to a representation of the curve and the control points in homogeneous coordinates. Remember, that's where we have not only our three space coordinates x, y, and z, but also this helper coordinate w of u. And we can always transform it back into three-dimensional space by dividing by w, as you can see here. So here we have the coordinates back in three-dimensional space by just dividing by w. And this allows us to use w as a weight. Yeah, so any non-rational curve can be transformed into a rational curve by adding w of u equals to 1. Because then here uh, we have a division by 1. Yeah, so here's an example. So we use some parametric curve. So here in this example it would be a rational Bezier curve. So B would be the Bezier polynomials. Here we have our control points. This is um, our 3D representation and now we can go to homogeneous coordinates by simply adding this coordinate W for this point. And uh, to have the connection here we need to multiply the um, 3D coordinates also with W such that if we divide it they disappear. Right. So here you can see the resulting parametric curve using homogeneous coordinates. So we just have four dimensions instead of three, but the, um, on the basis polynomials, they stay the same. You know, and then we can always go back into 3D coordinates um, by using this um, division here, the normalization. So after uh, constructing our curve, here we have the curve here in the 3D, 3D um, uh, for the first three coordinates and then we def divide by the last resulting helper coordinate and we are back into 3D space. Yeah, and here you can see this gives us an additional weight, right? So by dividing by this number we make sure that um, the resulting curve is inside of our control point polygon because all the weights add up to one in this way. Um, <coughs> yeah, and we can give this weight uh, um, higher values for the control points which we want to have um, um, more approximation to. Yeah, so here we have an additional control using the weight. So the control points weights are that determine how large the influence of a control point is on the resulting curve or waveform. The curve is drawn more towards the control point when its weight w is increased. Yeah, so here you can see an example. So in the first image you see the movement of the control point which causes each point on the curve to move in a parallel direction. So here you can see these points, this point is moved up, right? And then the entire curve follows. So we get an extension into, the, into this direction, but uh, it then it goes outside of this um, uh, convex hull, right? The polygon of the control points, the original control points. So sometimes that's not what we want, and that's why we want to use weights. So here V is the case where we set uh, where we increase the weight of this point here. So setting a weight causes each point of the curve to move along a line drawn by it to the control point. Right? So it still stays inside the original convex hull of the control points. But now it's drawn closer to this control point whose weight, whose weight we increased. Yeah. And we can do the same with B splines non-uniform rational B splines and this is also called NURBS, right? Non-uniform rational B splines. Same thing. So we have homogeneous coordinates and this is our transform back into 3D space. And again we have the weights of the control points in this way. Yeah, and here's the next Python example. 
So again, uh, we start with our example from last time, B spline interrupt true interval dot py. And now we ins um, insert a weight vector w at the beginning with um, all ones. So then we can take a look at it. And we can see then that the weight vector w produces the same curve as the B splines before. But if we increase the weight of the last point from say one to 10, the interpolation curve actually comes closer to that point. So instead of now um, repeating this last point, we just give the last point an increased weight. So let me try it, copy. So first open the editor, gedit.py. So here you can see it. So here we have our five points, P0 to P4. But now we have this weight vector W. So this contains um, five weights belonging to those four, uh, five control points. You can see the last one I wrote as a float because then we can easily um, insert any float number here. It doesn't even have to be integer. And you can see um, the spline polynomials again, right? So here again, they sum up to one. But now instead of having the interpolation with just the um, basis polynomials, we have the basis polynomial multiplied by the weights. So each basis polynomial is now multiplied by the weights. And here I divide by the sum of the weights such that um, the resulting curve is always inside the convex hull. So here for the first interval, the first curve segment, and here for the second curve segment. So for the beginning, everything is one, so this should be identical uh, to the previous two interval example for um, the non-rational splines. So here Python 3. Yeah, so you can see the result. Yeah, looks pretty much like our example. And we can actually try it again. Two interval, B spline, two interval. Yeah, so you can see it. This was the uniform non rational B spline. So, same curves. But now we can increase the weight. And instead of having 1.0 for the last one, I'm increasing it to 10. Right. So the uh, control points are unchanged, but now we have a much higher weight for the last one. And indeed, you can see now this last curve goes much closer to this last point. Remember previously it stopped somewhere around here, and now it's drawn towards this last point, which has now a much higher weight. So that works, right? So now we're happy about it. It works. Okay. So back to the slides. Yeah, so non-uniform rational B splines or NURBs are a generalization of both rational and non-rational BZ curves and B splines. Um, yeah, so it's um, in this case when I say NURBS, it's actually B splines, um, but it can also be applied to Bezier. So the advantages here are that they are invariant to projective transformation, right? So if you have like movement or scaling or rotation, you can apply to the control points instead of um, the final object. We have an exact mathematical representation of, for instance, any conic section like a circle, parabola, hyperbola, and so on. And we have added additional intuitive control point through control point weights compared to the non-rational ones. You know, here's a special case, the so-called ketmal rom splines. Um, here we have tangents at a point which are parallel to the neighboring points. So here we have two points and they create a tangent which this curve goes through at um, P2. 
Yeah, and that leads me to parametric surfaces. Um, they are generalization of parametric curves. So usually we want to have surfaces and not just curves, right? So that means now instead of having a one-dimensional helper variable u, we, we need two helper variable u and v for the two dimensions of the surface, right? So this way we get parametric surfaces and surface pieces or patches. So here's an example for a busy patch. Um, you can see it. So instead of having just one helper variable, we now have the two, which also means, means we need two basis polynomials, one for each dimension of the surface. And then we have control points on that surface. So in principle, it's the same thing as for the one dimensional case, just extended to two dimensions here. Yeah, and this is called a bicubic parametric area or surface. Yeah, so here we have the Bezier patch, which has 16 control points, right? Four in each dimension, so four squared is 16. We have 12 control points on the edges of the patch, and the edges themselves are Bezier curves. And we have four control points, which determine the surface area between the edges, so inside. And the wireframe representation of the patch usually is as a set of isoparametric lines, so for um, where one of the helper variables is set constant. So this is what you can see here. Here the P's are the control points of the surface patch, and here you can see the isoparametric curves. So in this direction the U stays constant, and in this direction the V stays constant. Yeah, and this shows what happens when you move a control point. So the area is then smoothly following the movement of that control point. Yeah, and here's the mathematical formulation. So again, it's basically the extension from 2D to 3D, which means you now have two um, helper variables, U and V, and you simply take um, the second helper variable and multiply it from the right-hand side. And you have a transposed basis polynomial here. So here you have the original um, basis, um, polynom um, basis matrix, BZ, and here the transposed basis matrix. The tricky part is now that this P here um, consists, consists of two dimensions of control points, but each control point itself is a, um, is a um, three-dimensional vector. So this is actually then a three-dimensional tensor. So you can see it's two-dimensional as a matrix, but then each point goes basically inside the screen um, into the third dimension for the three coordinates x, y, and z. So what you have here is actually a tensor multiplication. Yeah, so here's an example for the surfaces from BZA patches. We assemble individual patches into more complex surfaces, so neighboring patches. Um, con we need to apply conditions for the pos position continuity um, where it joins, where they join uh, at the joining point. We need a common outer edge of the patches, a common um, outer edge of the polyhedra. So here, this outer edge. And here we have this outer edge, which is common between those uh, two patches. And the four control points are at the edge of the image correspond to um, this here. So we have patch S and we have a patch R and we have those um, control points which co co coincide here for those two patches. Yeah, and this is necessary for a smooth transition between the patches. Um, we also usually want to have a tangential continuity, so C1. The four pairs of control point poly, uh, polygon edges that spread the boundary must be collinear, right? So that we don't get kinks. So you can see it here. Mathematically, they must uh, lie on the on a line. 
Yeah, that means uh, it's a great effort in the construction of larger compositive surfaces because you need to take care of it. Um, the surface normals, normals are determined from partial derivatives with respect to u and to v. Right, so again, two dimensions here. Yeah, and here you can see where the position is continuous, but we have a kink. Right, so first derivative is not continuous. Sometimes you want it, but sometimes you don't. Yeah, so if you want to have C1 continuity, you have to make sure that those control points are on a line. They are collinear. Right, and then you get a more or less smooth transition between the two surface patches. Yeah, here's an example, the Utah T port. So here you can see this consists of control points on the surface, and they are interpolated using um, BZ patches. And this is actually, um, you can um, import it in um, OpenCV, it's, it's part of the package, so it's um, convenient. Yeah, so um, the continuity is easier with B-spline patches, so you can do it basically quite similar as before, but now extend to um, two dimensions. A B-spline patch consists of several patch sections. We have four by four equals 16 control points for a single section. Uh, that also means we have 16 bivariate basis functions. So I should call this basis functions. Okay. Yeah, or one eight by eight node matrix uh, per section. Remember the nodes is um, basically the different sections of our um, um, curve. And the B-spline patch sections do not interpolate their control points. They only go along the control points, right, as usual. You can also repeat control points um, if you wish, um, as with curves. So here, this is how it looks like. So you can see it exact, basically exactly the same as for Bezier, just that we now have our B-spline basis functions, uh, which are two-dimensional here in this case. Right here, the two-dimensional basis functions, and they are basically the product of two one-dimensional basis functions. You know, here you can see an example. So here you can see also the typical property of B-splines. Uh, the curve is actually kind of small in comparison to the convex hull of the control points. Right? So you can imagine when you have then continue with the next piece here, the surface patch which is coming, then here we have another of those B-spline patch and so on. Yeah, that leads me to the summary. So parametric surfaces are easier to create and modify than polygon meshes. Curves can be manipulated more intuitively. Um, you know, this is German. Yeah, uh, natural and mathematically forms um, can be represented exactly using um, only a limited uh, memory requirement. B-splines and B-spline patches are often used as internal representation for high accuracy. So here, um, this is an internal representation, but then they can be converted to other display formats for rendering. So for rendering, usually we want to have pixels. Direct rendering from it often is too compu computationally expensive, and that's why we do it um, before. And the high accuracy for imaging is usually not required. So the approximation is okay. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you for your attention and then see you next time.